All right, everybody, thank you again so much for joining us today for this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Cohen, who is our invited guest for today. Um, Dr. Stanley Martin Cohen is the Medical Director of Hepatology at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center and Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Cohen practices and specializes in all areas of liver disease. He has published extensively on all aspects of liver disease. He has written international guidelines for the care of patients with liver disease. He is actively involved in national and international liver committees and societies. He is a fellow of the American College of Gastroenterology and the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. Specifically relevant to this presentation, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Cohen is the lead reviewer for the upcoming ACG guidelines on alcoholic liver disease. In addition, he was the past editor for alcoholic liver disease in clinics and liver disease. Uh, so thank you all for, for coming to this presentation. Dr. Cohen, I'm excited to hear what you have to teach us. So thanks again for inviting me to talk on alcoholic liver disease, and we're gonna focus on alcoholic hepatitis. Uh, this is the uh, sheet just goes through our objectives. I put a lot more on these slides than I'm gonna to get to, but I knew this was gonna be recorded. So this way, if people wanted to go back and look at anything else, there's a bit more information. I have no disclosures uh, from the alcohol industry, shall we say. So in terms of background, alcoholic liver disease, <clears throat> excuse me, which we're gonna call ALD, is the oldest form of liver disease. And about four to five percent of uh, people in the U.S. meet criteria for alcohol abuse, which we'll rename here in a second, or dependence. When you look at the bottom there, you see how important alcoholic liver disease, alcoholic cirrhosis, alcohol use in general is uh, in terms of causing large amounts of death. Uh, when you look at 2016, the 5% uh, of people who died were related to alcohol in some way, shape, or form, which actually exceeds hypertension and diabetes combined. Now, as I said, we're going to rename alcohol abuse. It's now AUD or alcohol use disorder. And we'll see that the prevalence has significantly increased over the last couple of decades. And we're also seeing a major increase in the amount of mortality from alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis. And as I'll show you a little later, especially in young women. And I'll show you some data from COVID-19. As many people have noticed, we're seeing a lot more behaviors uh, such as drug use, such as overeating, and of course, alcohol during this pandemic. Now, if we take a look here and we look at trends in alcoholic hepatitis, this was uh, one of the studies that one of our fellows is putting together. It's retrospective analysis looking at alcoholic liver disease. And really, we wanted to focus on alcoholic hepatitis. Why? Because we seem to be seeing more and more of it on the inpatient side. And as you see there, the incidence increased over a 10-year period from 39 per 100,000 to 131. And most of these people, by the time they saw us, they already had very advanced liver disease, high MELD scores, high MADRI scores. We'll come back to what those mean a little bit later. And we're trying to take a look at our same data, looking at alcoholic hepatitis before and after the COVID, or I should say before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. I assume we'll see even larger increases. Now, Sophie and our group was looking at same principle, but using the Explorers database. And we kind of had the pre-COVID and the during COVID uh, cohort. And again, that was a year ago. But what you'll see here is during COVID, there's been almost a three-time increase in alcoholic hepatitis, almost a four-time increase in alcoholic pancreatitis. And so again, probably not a surprise to anybody in this audience we're seeing more and more issues during COVID-19, probably just purely from the amount of increasing in uh, alcohol use. So, you know, one of the common questions we get is how much do you drink? And if the person doesn't give you much of an answer, then that may be as far as you go. So how much do you drink? I only have one a day. And so again, one is a relative thing. And again, you're gonna to have to push a little bit 
heavier and harder on your patients. So there are different ways to screen for alcohol use disorder. At the end of the day, these things take time. And so if you have the time, you can sit and talk to them. If you don't, you can always consider a questionnaire to give them before they see or even have the MA do this. And I just put a bunch of different guidelines on there. But um, again, probably history is as good as anything. The Audit C, which uh, outperforms CAGE, is a very quick one. The Audit C is actually only three questions. You see the NIAAA talks about just checking for binge drinking. And if they binge drink even once in the year, they're considered higher risk. Now, another thing that you may see from some of our charts that we're doing more and more of are these biomarkers for alcohol use. And so a patient who doesn't know the difference will get their labs done whenever they're done. But if you have a patient that knows better than to come up with a positive alcohol level, they'll know to come in six, eight hours later and it will be negative. So there are some of these metabolites of alcohol that last longer. So there's the urine ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate, which usually about two to three days before they disappear. So we oftentimes, if we catch someone on a Monday morning after a big weekend, we can catch these being positive. And you can imagine if they had been drinking heavily through Saturday night, but you got a simple blood alcohol level on Monday, that would be negative. The one that we're really switching over to though is mostly this PETH level phosphatidyl ethanol. And we really like this one, as you see here, this one goes out to a couple weeks. And when it's positive, it signifies significant alcohol use. And so important, the top one, the ethyl glucuronide picks up any alcohol use, but if your PETH is significantly elevated, that's telling us about a lot of alcohol with good sensitivity and specificity this has really become our go-to for our transplant candidates. And we'll come back to transplant. So how much is too much in terms of alcohol? I'm gonna give you two slides here to answer the question. First is general population. Next is in the patient with alcoholic liver disease or for that matter, any liver disease. So we have to define what alcohol means. And so roughly 10 to 15 grams is what you'll get in one glass of wine, one beer, or one shot of hard liquor. Obviously, extremely variable depending on what they're drinking, what the proof is, et cetera. And so AASLD says that you can drink up to two drinks a day for men and up to one drink a day for women. And again, this is general population. Now let's contrast this to how much can you drink in somebody with alcoholic liver disease and probably the answer is any amount of alcohol is going to potentially cause problems. And so you see the AASLD guidelines again should be counseled that there is no safe level of drinking that they should abstain. Because I get this question often, how much can I drink? How much do you let your patients drink? And I give them a very honest answer. I tell them I'm a liver expert. In my opinion, there is no safe amount of alcohol. They'll take that, um, you know, however they want to take it, but it's just the safest answer. Now, in terms of diagnosing alcoholic liver disease, a lot of it comes down to diagnosing alcohol use or for that matter, abuse. And as we said before, there's a lot of problems with the patients not reporting it, the provider being in a rush, the provider not wanting to get on the patient's bad side. And so really we just have to have a low threshold. And, you know, we all think about the um, alcoholic who was found down on the street and everybody laughs and says, oh, that's easy to diagnose. And of course it is, but really it's much more and many times the wealthy closet alcoholics, the people that you would never think about it. And oftentimes when you ask, the answer is absolutely no, and they're offended. And then in walks the uh, significant other who says, you know, what are you talking about? You're a big drinker. So again, keep in mind alcohol crosses all ethnicities, all races, all sex, all um, financial groups, and you just have to think about it. 
So the risk factors for developing alcoholic liver disease and really specifically alcoholic cirrhosis, at the end of the day, it's the amount of alcohol as well as the length of time. And so you see here that generally 60 to 80 grams per day or more in men or 30 grams per day or more in female for many years increases your risk of cirrhosis. But at the end of the day, only six to 41% of people will develop cirrhosis. So obviously it is alcohol, but there's gonna be genetics and environmental factors here as well. The common comment we always get is, well, my neighbor drinks twice what I drink and he has no liver disease. But again, there's a lot of genetic and other variables here. So in terms of risk factors for developing you know, alcoholic liver disease, you see a whole list here. Women develop alcoholic liver disease at lower amounts of alcohol. Daily drinking seems to be a bigger issue. We talked about the amount of alcohol. Binge drinking seems to be an issue. And you'll see binge drinking specifically for alcoholic hepatitis. There are some genetic factors here, and you can see some protective as well as um, some that increase the risk. And then on the bottom here, I would point out that other liver diseases. And so I have many patients with what I'll call NASH and ASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and alcoholic steatohepatitis. So again, competing liver diseases, hepatitis C, another classic example. It's been estimated the risk of cirrhosis from hep C and alcohol is over 30 times higher than alcohol alone or hepatitis C alone. Now, in terms of the clinical manifestations, this is where we start to get into, is there mild alcoholic liver disease, moderate or severe? And so I put in my spectrum here of simple reversible fatty change to alcoholic hepatitis to cirrhosis. Now, this is not an A becomes B becomes C kind of thing. People can jump around to different things. But in terms of the reversible fatty liver on the left, we find that they are asymptomatic. Their exam and labs are normal. If we go to the far right, most of the time, our cirrhotic patients are symptomatic to some degree. Their exam is usually abnormal and their labs are usually abnormal. But the one that we all see and is very obvious is the alcoholic hepatitis or acute alcoholic hepatitis. There we see the gross jaundice, we see the obvious societies, and we see grossly abnormal labs. So we're going to spend more time talking about alcoholic hepatitis. Now, in terms of physical findings, this is an old picture from an old textbook probably decades ago. And we think about all of the usual findings, spider angiomata, muscle wasting, gynecomastia, uh, palmar erythema, et cetera. And again, this is something that we still see occasionally with our alcoholic cirrhotics. So I will admit most people are sending them earlier than uh, later. So we're not quite seeing as many of these as we normally saw before. Now, keep in mind, alcohol affects other organs. Now, this is important for all of us, whether you're in general care, whether you're in cardiology, general GI, uh, neuro, you know, neurology, you're going to see a lot of different potential issues here. And this may also impact our transplantability because if someone's got severe cardiomyopathy, this becomes an issue. Goes back to your level of suspicion here, which is they say they don't drink, but they have bad pancreas, bad liver, they have neuropathy, cardiomyopathy. Again, they probably, you've got to really look and consider could alcohol be underlying many of these. Now, in terms of lab data, everybody who's, you know, Oh, my age and older will remember GGT and everybody got the screening GGT. GGT is no longer recommended to be used as a screening test for alcohol. It's too nonspecific. If we look at AST and ALT, we see that classic AST greater than ALT ratio. But a couple important things. In alcoholic hepatitis, generally the levels do not exceed 300. 
And definitely if you're over 500, you wanna think about other diagnoses. Also, as you go into any liver disease, for example, hepatitis C, your ALT is higher than the AST, but as they become cirrhotic, you start to see the AST get higher. So again, in the acute setting, AST over ALT is suggestive of alcohol, but there are other diseases that can cause it. Now, bilirubin elevations, elevated MCVs, again, there can be other clues for alcohol, but obviously there are other reasons for those labs as well. So again, all of these can be suggestive without absolutely diagnostic. Imaging, again, I have a lot of ASH plus NASH patients. So when you see fatty liver, it doesn't mean alcohol. It could be alcohol, it could be fatty liver, it could be a combination. Obviously, if you see advanced portal hypertension with varices, et cetera, suggesting more advanced liver disease. Now, liver biopsy is one of the more difficult ones. And who biopsy, why biopsy, what will you get out of it? And I think it's an important point because some uh, hepatologists biopsy everybody, uh, others biopsy almost nobody. I'm on that end. I tend not to biopsy these people a lot unless I feel I'm gonna get something specifically different out of the result. So I will bring up one example where I do like to think about biopsy, which is, don't be fooled that portal hypertension means cirrhosis. With severe alcoholic hepatitis, the liver cells can swell up dramatically and you can get portal hypertension. You can get ascites and varices and jaundice and hepatic encephalopathy. But if they stop drinking, that swelling can go away and they don't necessarily have to have cirrhosis. So when this 25-year-old kid comes in who's been binging for the last five years with severe alcoholic hepatitis, and they see me back a few months later, labs are better, they stop drinking, I may consider a biopsy to see if they have cirrhosis. On the other hand, they're 70 years old, they've been drinking for 50 years, and the imaging studies show obvious cirrhosis, I'm probably just going to assume they have it. The reason I bring up this slide is it sort of shows you the idea that you can go from a normal liver here to severe alcoholic hepatitis in the right bottom corner, but you can go back up to normal if you stop drinking and you did not have underlying cirrhosis. Now, obviously this, you see the blue lines here. This is a trichrome stain showing you the scarring. These people, or this person has well-established cirrhosis. So you can go from a normal liver over decades of drinking to cirrhosis. You can go from a normal liver to alcoholic hepatitis or back. You can also go from alcoholic hepatitis eventually to cirrhosis. So again, might consider a biopsy if it gives me an idea of where I'm at. And again, in that 25-year-old, if it turns out they have no fibrosis, can probably get rid of them from my clinic and just tell them to stop drinking. Now, there is another comment that's always made that you might find something else you weren't expecting. So it's been estimated 15 to 20% of liver biopsies who you were pretty convinced were alcoholic liver disease might have something else. But I think at the end of the day, the main reason for a biopsy for me has always been to get the most definitive staging. What's the fibrosis level? Now, in terms of the differential of biopsy, part of the reason I don't do a ton of biopsies is that NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver, can look exactly like alcoholic liver disease. Uh, and then you see some of the more unusual causes, genotype 3, hep C, Wilson's, TPN, and a few medications. So if I do have somebody that's on, say, amiodarone uh, or somebody who's been on TPN and I really need to know we could consider a biopsy, but suffice it to say the alcoholic liver biopsy is consistent with, but not 100% diagnostic. And as I said, you can have both ASH and NASH. And as you can imagine in the COVID-19 pandemic, people have been sitting home drinking a lot more. They've also been home uh, eating a lot more. So we've seen a lot of weight gain and a lot of alcohol. 
I'm not 100% convinced that pathologists can tell the difference. If they're on this call, I apologize for that statement. But uh, at the bottom there, as a general point, AST over ALT suggestive of alcohol, ALT over AST more suggestive of non-alcohol. But again, I have many patients with both. Now, we've talked about this spectrum of alcoholic liver disease. And I put in this red line here because something happens here. This is the key point. Here's simple steatosis here. And these people, they drink, they get fat in the liver, they stop drinking, it goes away. But at some point, you get a change into actual hepatitis. You get steatohepatitis to the right of this line. And this is where you run into the problems of fibrosis, alcoholic hepatitis, cirrhosis. So if we look through simple fatty liver, this is how alcohol is metabolized. When you drink, it's metabolized into fat, and you will see fatty change almost immediately after starting drinking. <clears throat> and you might see some elevated liver enzymes. You might see fatty liver on an imaging study, but in general, stop drinking, it goes away. I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum, which is cirrhosis. We've talked about the 6 to 41%. We look at prognostic indicators, which is our MELD score or model for end-stage liver disease score, as well as our child Pew score. And then we look for the complications. Again, treatment is abstinence, but this one is not reversible in and of itself. Now, let's go to the middle here. So we have a pair of 43-year-old men each drink one case of beer a day. Both didn't feel well and got admitted. The guy on the left said he gets maybe a little yellow at times. The guy on the right has jaundice. They have the same AST, ALT, the same creatinine. But the guy on the left has a normal bilirubin. The one on the right has a very high bilirubin, as well as INR and white count. <clears throat> so it's important to be able to recognize these somewhat similar patients but the one on the left probably has some form of milder alcoholic liver disease. The guy on the right has severe alcoholic hepatitis. <clears throat> I just I look at these as two people that fell and got drunk and broke their leg and got admitted to the hospital. We need to know the difference because we may or may not take one to surgery. We may or may not talk about mortalities and outcomes. So alcoholic hepatitis, very, very serious disease. I bring up the name and I always talk on rounds of how important it is to name this correctly because many times I find that this patient over here, the chart says alcoholic hepatitis. But when I see alcoholic hepatitis, I'm talking about someone who's got a 30 or 40% chance of dying in the next month. Again, very different than the first patient who just broke his ankle and just has a bilirubin of one. So again, very common in hospitalized patients. Many of them already have cirrhosis by the time we see them. Now, you can look at this whole chart. And again, as I said, there's things I'm going to leave on here that people can go back and review. But alcoholic hepatitis, these are usually in our biggest drinkers oftentimes more than 100 grams a day, which is roughly 10 drinks. And many times they stop drinking a week or two or three ago. So many people say, oh, well, they can't have alcoholic hepatitis, they stopped drinking. Keep in mind, they probably stopped drinking because they were so sick, they couldn't drink, uh, didn't feel like drinking. And so again, don't be fooled into that one or two weeks of abstinence. Classically on the left there, on exam findings, jaundice, tender hepatomegaly, fever, ascites encephalopathy. On the right, AST greater than ALT. The difference here is the bilirubin is up, the INR is up, and oftentimes the white count is up. I put some asterisks there. The asterisks are there to show you that this can look like cholangitis or you know, Charcot's triad with right upper quadrant pain, fever, and jaundice. So you probably do at least need to get an ultrasound to make sure you're not dealing with a biliary tract issue. 
Now on biopsy, if you biopsy them, we see acute sclerosing hyaline necrosis. The hyaline is the Mallory's bodies or Mallory's hyaline here and here, this ropey pinky eosinophilic material. The acute are the PMNs oriented around this. And then the necrosis is, of course, cell death, and the sclerosis is uh, fibrosis. Now, this can look the same as severe NASH or amiodarone toxicity. You're going to probably need some history to differentiate. Now, in terms of the prognosis, why am I harping so much on severe alcoholic hepatitis? Because about 35 to 45% of them will die within a month. And for all of our other specialties online, that's higher than lung cancer one month mortality, that's higher than an acute MI. And so again, we need to recognize it. Keep an eye on that big yellow asterisk, we'll come back to that in a moment. Now I told you that the numbers of alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis are rising. This is data from a few years ago. Uh, these lines have continued to increase and you're seeing an increasing proportion of women showing up in alcoholic hepatitis disease and alcoholic hepatitis mortality. Now there, you can go through lists of prognostic indicators and I'll show you in a minute how you can put all these together, but you'll see here older age, other injuries such as kidney, worsening labs, more alcohol, these are all suggestions that you're gonna have a worse prognostic uh, outcome. Here is looking at alcohol amount. And what you see is these people drank over 120 grams, their survival dramatically lower than the people that drank 60 to 120 grams. Now you can memorize the chart from three slides ago, or you can know that there are prognostic scoring systems that you can use. MDF, which is the MADRI discriminant function most commonly used, MELDs, ABICs, GHS. So again, a whole bunch of systems. And what they're looking at is combinations of labs and clinical findings. And they're meant to do a couple things. They're meant to tell you who has, quote, severe alcoholic hepatitis, and number two, who should we start on steroids, which we'll talk about steroids in a moment. The MADRI score, which I said is the most commonly used, 4.6 times the change in pro-time plus bilirubin. If their MADRI score is greater than or equal to 32 or they have hepatic encephalopathy, that's considered severe with the high mortality. The problem is it's used once and only once. So you check it right at the beginning and you don't follow it. Then there's the MELD score. As you know, we use this for transplant. And when the MELD gets over 11, it's similar to the MADRI score. And some people have proposed, excuse me, some people have proposed this Delta MELD, following the MELD in the first two weeks in the first week, and if it goes up by more than or equal to two, it has increased mortality. What I'll show you on this slide is it probably doesn't matter. So I kind of overlapped all these different prognostic scores, and you'll notice they perform relatively similarly. So I think the point is, pick what you want. Most people like MADRI, some will use MELD, and these will all give you a prediction of whether this is severe alcoholic hepatitis as well as outcomes. Now, in terms of treatments, this list goes on and on and on. And many of these have been around for years and years and some decades. And some have been successful, some not so much. Uh, I'll go through these a little bit. Abstinence is still the first line therapy whether it's going to reverse alcoholic hepatitis or not, it can at least hopefully prevent some of the ongoing damage. We're gonna ignore colchicine, PTU, insulin, glucagon, anabolic steroids, they do not work. Nutritional therapy, there's no question these patients have protein and protein calorie malnutrition. 
Anabolic steroids did not change mortality. There was an old study done that looked at enteral feeds versus prednisone, found no difference in mortality. As I put there, the optimist would say that it's as good as prednisone. The pessimist would say it's no better than prednisone, and I'm not sure that prednisone works. So the point is we do recommend nutritional therapy, but it's really to help the patient rather than help the alcoholic hepatitis in my mind. Then we get into corticosteroids, and this has been a debate for decades. The theory is that they reduce inflammation, reduce cytokine production, and they can be used for people with the MADRI score greater than or equal to 32 who have severe alcoholic hepatitis. Now you'll notice in the bottom there, many of those studies excluded renal failure, GI bleeding and infection, which makes them a little bit difficult to interpret. Though nowadays there's been more studies showing that if the infection is treated and or it's minor, you can probably get away with steroids. Well, here was a meta-analysis that looked at 11 studies. And what they found was that the combined mortality reduction was 37% by using steroids. But if you go above, seven out of 11 showed no mortality benefit. My rule of thumb is if your studies are negative and you have to do a meta-analysis to prove that there's something real there, you wanna question the data. Well, as I said, I showed you one meta-analysis there are so many studies, there are now meta-analyses of meta-analyses of meta-analyses. There have been Cochrane analyses. And at the end of the day, it seems as if there is some mortality benefit from the use of steroids, but it's not a absolute cut and dry. Now I showed you all of those prognostic scales the one that I didn't comment on before was the Leal model. It was on that original chart. The Leal model is another score to say if somebody has severe alcoholic hepatitis or not, but it has a more important function, which is you do it at day zero and you do it at day seven and you see what the score is. If their score is high, it's suggesting that they are not going to respond to steroids. If it's low, it suggests that they are going to respond. So this is the only prognostic score that doesn't tell us when to start steroids. It tells us when to stop steroids. So a lot of the people that had trouble believing the steroid data and said, I don't wanna leave them on high dose steroids for 28 days are now comfortable using a Leal model, which you can get with that calculator there, lealmodel.com and maybe stop them at seven days. And here, for example, we see a survival in the group with the low Leal score compared to the high Leal score. Pentoxifiline in the interest of time was very exciting. It's a weak inhibitor of TNF. We thought it was gonna work well. And in the first study up here, it did. Subsequent studies showed no overall reduction. So, Pentoxifiline has kind of fallen out of favor. Now, if you noticed before, when I put that asterisk up, it said that the mortality was 35 to 45%. There was another study that came out in 2015, the STOP AH trial. And as you see here in the bottom, it was the largest single study ever done, placebo versus steroids versus pentoxifiline versus steroids plus pentoxifiline. And you see here, pentoxifiline, there was no difference in mortality. Prednisolone, there was a small difference and overall, no real big difference. Let me go to the summation slide here. Prednisolone decreased the one month mortality by 39%, but there was no decrease in mortality at 90 days or one year. Pentoxifiline had no effect on mortality, but there's a big problem here, which is if we look at the mortality here, we see that their mortality at 28 days was about 12 to 15%. So the reason I say there's a bit of a problem with this study is their mortality rates are so much lower, 
it's not exactly clear if we can compare this study to what the patients we see here in the US. So suffice it to say, most of us are still using steroids or at least considering it. Now, if TNF is driving some of this inflammation, what about, you know, instead of pentoxyphylline, which is a weak TNF binder, why don't we go with the big guns? And so we see, you know, infliximab, we see Enbrel, and we see here that there was increased mortality in both of these studies. So anti-TNF agents are not used for alcoholic hepatitis. Side note, interestingly, TNF is needed for liver regeneration, which probably explains some of this. Now, steroids versus with or without N-acetylcysteine, which is our go-to drug for liver toxicity from acetaminophen, you see here that survival was better in the prednisolone and acetylcysteine group, but it did not hit statistical significance at three months, and six months. So positive trend, but still a negative study. GCSF does stimulate some liver regeneration. This was a simple open label study of um, GCSF with pentoxyphylline versus pentoxyphylline alone. And the combo group had better survival. Small study still warrants further, further investigation, but could be something down the road. So these are the double ASLD guidelines as of 2020. Alcohol abstinence, assessed for nutritional deficiencies, mild alcoholic hepatitis, if they don't meet that criteria for severe, should be watched without medications. Interestingly, they sort of said for severe, do prednisone, prednisolone with or without N-acetylcysteine, even based on just the one small study, and then pentoxyphylene no longer recommended. And again, whoever wants to go back and look at this, it's basically everything that we've said, which is if you're a candidate for steroids, do it for a week and use the LEAL model. If you respond, continue the full course. If you don't, you're gonna come up this direction. And it says something here that doesn't make sense. Consider early liver transplant. Now you can't transplant active alcoholics or can you? And that's where we're gonna spend the rest of our time. So let's talk liver transplant for general alcoholic liver disease. And so here, the indications are the same as anybody else on the bottom. MELT score usually 15 or above, all of the standard complications of portal hypertension, varices, encephalopathy, et cetera. Now, the length of sobriety has always been this magical six months. You have to be sober for six months. That was completely made up. Those were based on survey studies of, hey, how long do you guys wait? Oh, we wait six months. Okay, that's about the average. That's where it came in. So most of us are now looking at favoring a formal evaluation by social worker, mental health provider, psychologist, psychiatrist, and factoring that in along with a length of time of sobriety. So again, the six month rule definitely not set in stone. At the end of the day, after transplant recidivism rate return to drinking is gonna be 15 to 25%. You'll see that there's been a big change in liver transplant over the last 15 years. Used to be hep C there in blue, and now all of a sudden you see dramatic increase in alcoholic liver disease. Probably twofold. Number one, hep C cure rates have gotten amazingly good. And number two, we're seeing more and more alcohol. And again, I can show it to you in many different ways, but all this is showing you is that we're seeing more and more alcohol. And not only just over the last five to 10 years, we're seeing it even dramatically in the COVID era versus the pre-COVID era. Now, in terms of outcomes for general alcoholic liver disease, this slide is just clumping many different types of liver disease that got transplanted. And you see that the survival rate is essentially the same. So the point is that Outcomes for liver transplant for general alcoholic liver disease, the same as other indications. Now, recidivism rates, 15 to 25%.
if you drink a significant amount, this will catch up with patients. This is an older study, but we see here for the people they defined as abusive drinking, which they actually didn't define exactly what that meant in the study, but I think we can at least get an idea. People who drank a significant amount had statistically significant drops in patient and graft survival. So as we said, you can transplant general alcoholic liver disease, but we've always been taught you can't transplant alcoholic hepatitis <clears throat> because it implies that they're actively drinking. Well, along comes a study based out of France from at this point, it's been more than a decade ago, talking about early liver transplant for severe alcoholic hepatitis. Now, this was a very select group. This was not every alcoholic that came waltzing in. And in fact, it was less than 2% of their alcoholic hepatitis patients. Criteria, no prior episodes of alcoholic hepatitis, supportive family, no severe coexisting conditions, and a voiced commitment to alcohol abstinence. And what you find here was that the six-month survival was... 77%, possibly a little lower than what we see in most of our instances of transplant, but compare that to the people who um, just stopped drinking or, and or went back to drinking with just standard medical care, 23%. Only three of their patients, so roughly 9% of their patients resumed alcohol after transplant. So if we go to the United States and we look at the UNOS uh, database, so our, our national transplant database, we see that 46 patients, and again, this is an older study, underwent alcoholic hepatitis liver transplants. And when they compared them to people that just had standard alcoholic cirrhosis who had been abstinent, you see down here that the five-year patient and graft survival were essentially even showing that when you do liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis, their survival is equivalent. Now, this is looking a little more recent. This is 2018. And what they found was the three-year survival, 84%, which is not out of line with any of our indications for transplant, and a 17% sustained use of alcohol after transplant. Now, there were several factors in the box below that suggested higher risk of alcohol use. Younger age, lack of complete acceptance of their alcoholic hepatitis diagnosis, more than 10 drinks, any use of alcohol post-liver transplant, sustained use of alcohol. These were all associated with worse outcomes. And what they showed here was that any alcohol use after transplant had a significant drop. I mean, you drop from almost 100% survival down to 75% in three years. Now, this is the Accelerate data. This is their most uh, recent. This just came out last month. And really what it was, was it was extending the three-year to five-year and you see 82% five-year survival, which is well in line with what we see from any other indication. And what they found with longer time was you had more people drinking. About 29% started to drink, but only 8% of them were drinking early on within one year and were drinking heavily. And what you found on the bottom there was that the people who drank early and or heavy had worse outcomes. They also came up with a SALT score, sustained alcohol use after liver transplant. And again, similar to what they had found in their first study, more than 10 drinks, failed prior rehab attempts, legal issues, usually uh, driving while intoxicated, or prior other illicit substance abuse. And if they had a SALT score less than five, they had a 95% negative predictive value for avoiding um, alcohol afterward. Now, some people have said, well, now hang on a minute. All you're going to do is take every wet alcoholic and give them every liver, which means every PBC, every hep C, every fatty liver gets no livers. 
keep in mind the numbers are not that big. These should be very selected groups. So for example, in this study, of all their patients that they looked at with alcoholic hepatitis at Hopkins, only 5.6% got listed, not transplanted, just listed. In this study, same thing of their 111, only 13.5% got listed. And again, only a small percent of these will get transplanted. So again, we're not talking about taking every wet alcoholic, but we're talking about a very sub subset. This is how we do it at UH. Uh, this has to be their first episode of alcoholic liver disease. They have to fail or not be able to take steroids. In other words, if we could medically rescue them, we're gonna do that first. Uh, they cannot have failed a prior rehab program. They have to have adequate social support. They are seen by our social worker and our psychologist before and after. They have to sign a contract and kind of go through a very intensive psychosocial program. We have a multidisciplinary team in place. And again, we're following this data because this is all relatively new, not just for our program, but for every program across the country. The goal is to publish on the nationwide experience and see how is the outcome how is the survival? How is the recidivism? And decide if this is the right thing to be done. So conclusion, so that I get my 10 minutes ahead of time for questions. Alcoholic liver disease, alcohol use disorder, and alcoholic hepatitis are increasing. I think the most important thing we need to do is to find the patient, screen appropriately. There are alcohol abstinence treatments. We're not really using them in the liver division, at least that I know of, one or two of my partners may be, but I know that um, the ChemDEP people are, they're addiction specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, don't be afraid to talk with them. Alcoholic hepatitis mortality is increasing. And again, we need to very specifically recognize alcoholic hepatitis, stop alcohol use completely, talk about steroids, and then possibly in a very select group, talk about liver transplant, realizing that people have ethical issues and possibly financial issues with that. So at that point, I'm going to wrap it up and it leaves us five or 10 minutes for questions. I know it was kind of a whirlwind uh, adventure through alcoholic liver disease, but again, there's a lot more data on the slides and it's available for anybody who wants to go back and look at them. Is there a safe amount of, of wine of, to take with dinner? You know, it depends on who the patient is. If it's your average non-alcoholic liver disease patient, you know, based on those double ASLD guidelines, they would say up to two drinks a day for men, up to one drink a day for women. I'm not a big fan of that recommendation. I don't like when someone's doing one or two a day. I think it sets us up for an issue, but it makes me feel very comfortable when someone says, oh, a couple times a week, I'll have a glass of wine, or I'll go out on the weekend and have a glass of wine or a beer. I'm fine with that. And again, you know, the cardiologists may come back and say, well, there's been data suggesting that red wine is beneficial in a glass or two. So my comment back to them is you're a, you're a heart guy, I'm a liver guy. We can kind of uh, fail to see eye to eye on that one. But I think, you know, if you believe the double A guidelines, it's the two in one, but I'm still a little nervous on that. So is it, if there is a safe amount? Well, like I said, I'll, I'll fall back to those guidelines, 20 grams or less a day for men, 10 grams or less a day for women. Questions Dr. Cohen, it looks like there's a lot of questions in the chat. I don't know if you wanna scroll through and address any of those. If I don't mess up the computer here, so. Um, I can also so, read them for you if you want. Oh, that's okay. So, you know, what's the percent in a drink? Instead of percent, it's really grams. And so, like I said, roughly 10-ish grams 
per shot, per um, beer, per glass of wine, but that's gonna vary dramatically. And question, is there any lab testing for genetic predisposition? That's being looked at. There actually have been some suspect genes. Nothing has ever come out that's been definitive. People are doing a lot of tests looking at panels. And so I think that's one of those, let's give that some time. Um, so if someone has fatty liver, but no overt signs of chronic liver disease, what do you recommend? I'm gonna be a liver guy and I'm gonna be strict. And I'm gonna say, if you have a liver disease, you have a liver disease. So whether that's mild hepatitis C, fatty liver, et cetera, I'm gonna still recommend that I would avoid alcohol knowing that many of them are going to still drink to some degree. So maybe if I help them cut by 50%, I would be happy with that. So <clears throat> what is the role of the fibro scan? Technically, fibro scan is not FDA indicated for alcoholic liver disease. Having said that, it's used for alcoholic liver disease and probably runs very similar to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It was actually a list of normals and a list of the different fibrosis scores. And I like it for some of these young people. So I told you that in my 20 some year olds who I think I wanna know for sure if they have cirrhosis or not, I've always done biopsies. I'm not at all opposed to starting to do fibro scans now. So I'm guessing that's where that question came from. And it's a legitimate question. I will caution you though about FibroScan. FibroScan can be artificially elevated with active alcohol use. So if I'm gonna use a FibroScan, I really want them to be off alcohol for a couple months. When I have my ASH and NASH patients, my 300 pounder with diabetes who drinks a lot, I oftentimes tell them to specifically stop drinking and we'll do the FibroScan a month or two down the road. Now, in terms of um, mortality differences between alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic, it sort of depends where you are on the spectrum of whichever. So for example, there's simple, reversible, non-alcoholic fatty liver. So if someone gains weight, they get some fat, they lose weight, it goes away. The equivalent of alcoholic hepatitis in this situation is really NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And so the difference between simple fatty liver is NASH, simple fatty alcoholic liver is alcoholic hepatitis. So when you get to those circumstances, you have a dramatically higher risk of bad outcomes. The difference with NASH is you have a higher risk of cirrhosis. With alcoholic hepatitis, you have a higher risk of very quick mortality as well as um, uh, progression to cirrhosis. Now, people were asking about treatments for um, alcohol abstinence. I'll be honest, I don't prescribe them. I don't use them. You do have to be careful with some of them. Some you can get away with in end-stage liver disease. Some you really don't want to. Antibuse you don't want to use with a very severe liver disease. So I would say probably work with your chem dep people though I've seen some of the primary care docs start to use some of them. How many, CC, how many cc's is 10 grams? It depends on what you're drinking. So roughly 10 grams is that one ounce of hard liquor, um, one standard pour of wine or a standard 12 ounce beer. But again, varies wildly depending on the uh, proof of it. And keep in mind, even so-called non-alcoholic beverages do, still do contain a very small amount of alcohol. And again, not something that's gonna pop up on a uh, screen, but I have some people literally who stopped drinking six pack of beer and are now drinking 30 to 36 non-alcoholic beers a day they're gonna get some alcohol in their system from that. Any other questions at all or anything you have, Rebecca? No, I don't think so. I don't have any others. Um, 
thank you so much, though. This was fantastic. I think that was that was really wonderful, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to do this grand rounds and answer all of our questions. Um, thank you. If anybody has questions, you know, feel free to email me anytime. Be happy to go through anything. But thanks again.